In our last lecture, we met the finite fields of order p. We notated those as f sub p, like this. You'll remember that the elements of f p were written as ordinary integers, but we regarded two of those ordinary integers as being equal if and only if they differed by an a multiple of p. Now, in any field, any non-zero element of that field has to have a multiplicative inverse. That's part of the definition of being a field. A multiplicative inverse for an element x just means 1 over x. And we experimented a little with the finite field f5, and we found that, for example, in f5, the multiplicative inverse of 3 was equal to 2. The reason for that was that 2 times 3 was equal to 1, because 2 times 3 is 6, and in the finite field f5, 6 is equal to 1. But what about if we wanted to know about multiplicative inverses in some larger field, where we weren't just able to do this by trial and error, as we did in f5? So, for example, just to take a, another small example, in f17, we could ask what is 1 divided by 12. What's the multiplicative inverse of 12? Well, you can do this by trial and error. You can just try um, various different numbers and see which one works. But of course, that becomes very tedious because there's lots of different things to check. And in a larger finite field, it would be even worse. So what we'd like is a procedure which will enable us to calculate multiplicative inverses in finite fields of order p, no matter how large p is. And that's the subject of this video. I'm going to begin with a reminder of division with remainder. So if we have two positive integers, x and y, then what division with remainder is, is the following statement. So it says that there exist positive integers q and r, such that x is q times y plus r, and r is greater than or equal to 0, but less than y. So what's going on here is you try and divide x by y, and you get a quotient q and a remainder r. When you divide by y, the remainder is always less than r. So for example, if you want to divide 17 by 5, well, you can't do it exactly, but you can write 17 as 3 times 5 plus a remainder of 2. So here is my y, here is my remainder, here is my x. Uh, equally, if we want to divide 31 by 7, then 31 is equal to 4 times 7, that's 28, plus a remainder of 3. So here, my y is 7, my x is 31, my q was 4, and my remainder was 3. That's division with remainder. And division with remainder is what's going to help us to come up with multiplicative inverses in finite fields with p elements. So what's on this slide is a theorem here. It says if p is a prime number and a is a whole number between 0 and p, then there exist whole numbers s and t such that a times s plus p times t is equal to 1. So why is this helpful in our quest for multiplicative inverses? Well, the answer to that is that this number s is the multiplicative inverse for a in the finite field fp. Let's see why that is. In fp, a times s is equal to 1. And the reason for that is because a times s differs from 1 by a multiple of p, namely p times t. So think in fp, Two things are equal if and only if they differ by, or two integers are equal if and only if they differ by a multiple of p. So since a times s differs from 1 by a multiple of p, a times s equals 1 in the finite field fp. So uh, 1 over a is equal to 1. So if we had a procedure which, given a and p, would find these numbers s and t, then that would solve our problem of finding multiplicative inverses, because the multiplicative inverse for a is equal to s. Uh, I've written 1 there for some reason. I meant s. OK, so how can we do this? How can, how can we actually find these numbers s and t? Well, if you want to read the, the 
proof of this theorem, then you can find this proof in the typed lecture notes, in, in the online lecture notes for Math0005. I'm not going to write out the full proof of the theorem because it takes a little while to do. What I will do is show you how the proof of the theorem works and how you go about finding these numbers s and t. What the proof does is does a sequence of divisions with a remainder. First of all, it divides p by a. So we get p is a quotient times a plus a remainder, which I'm going to call r2 just for consistency with the notation in my proof in the online notes, where what we get to assume is that r2 is less than a. That's the property that remainders have. They're smaller than the thing you divided by. Okay, next step, we divide a by r2. So we get a quotient times r2 plus a remainder r3, and this time r3 is less than r2. Okay, let's say we do it again. This time we divide r2 by r3, and we get a remainder r4, which is less than r3. Okay, you can see that these remainders keep decreasing. They keep strictly decreasing, in fact. So eventually, because they're whole numbers, they've got to hit zero. So let's say at the next stage, r3 equals q5 r4. And let's say the next remainder was actually zero. So sooner or later it's going to happen. And just to illustrate my proof, I'm going to assume that actually this happened for the first time uh, when we took r5. So r5 was equal to zero. So I claim that actually the last non-zero remainder, in this case r4, must be equal to 1. So in this case, so the case when r4 was the last non-zero remainder, r4 must be equal to 1. Well, why is that? So I'm going to establish that by showing you that r4 actually is a divisor of the prime number p. So it's a positive number. It's less than p because it's less than r3, and r3 is less than r2, and r2 is less than a, and a is less than p. So if it divides p and it's less than p, then because p is a prime number, it must be 1. So this is true because, well, let's look line by line at what happens. So looking at this line, r4 is a divisor of r3. r3 is a multiple of r4, so r4 divides r3. So from this line, r4 divides r3. But now let's look at the next line up. So on this line here, you have r4 here, and you have r3, which is a multiple of r4. So the whole right-hand side is divisible by r4. And that means the left-hand side is divisible by r4 as well. So this, on this side, r4 divides r2. Okay, moving a line up, um, r3 is divisible by r4. We know this. r2 is divisible by r4. So the whole right-hand side of that equation is divisible by r4. So the left-hand side is divisible by r4 too. So r4 divides a. And then finally, making the same argument on the top line, we get r4 divides the prime number p. So just as some notation here, just in case you're not familiar with this, when I write u line v like this, let me make that a bit straighter, u line, come on, u line v like this means u divides v, or v is a multiple of u. All right, what have we done? We've established that r4 is a divisor of the prime number p, and so because p is prime, It must be that r4 was equal to 1. Okay, well, how does that help? Um, it enables us to rewrite this um, third line here. So let's go back to line 3 here. 
and let's see what we can say now. So what have I got? I've got R2 is equal to Q4 R3 plus 1. So 1 is equal to R2 minus Q4 times R3. Okay, let's now go back and substitute. Um, I know that R2 is equal to P minus Q2 times A. That's from the first line there. So R2 is P minus Q2 A and then minus Q4 times what's R3? R3 is equal to A minus Q3 R2. Okay, what have I got now? P minus Q2 times A minus Q4 times A minus Q3 times, what's R2? It's P minus Q2 A. All right, now what we have here is a total mess, but I think you'll agree if we expand the brackets here, all we've got is multiples of P and multiples of A. So if you expand those brackets, multiply out and collect terms in P and A, what you'll get is something times P plus something times A. All right, now that was what we wanted. We've written 1 as something times P times something plus something times A. We can compute those somethings because they're just multiples of the numbers, the Qs and the R Rs which appeared in our calculation. And therefore, we managed to write 1 as a multiple of P plus a multiple of A. And we've got a way for actually finding those multiples, which is just to do this calculation here. OK, as I say, if you'd like to see this proof written out carefully, you can find it in the online notes. What I'm really concerned with is how we can actually use it to compute multiplicative inverses. So it looks like an awful, horrible mess, but actually it's easier than it looks. So let's try some examples so I can try and convince you of this. So here are our examples. Um, let's return to one of the ones which I mentioned in uh, on the very first slide. So that one on the very first slide was, what is the multiplicative inverse of 12 in F17? So we want the 1 over 12 in F17. So how do we do this? Well. What the procedure which we had on the previous slide was, was simply to do lots of division with remainders. So we start off with 17 is 1 times 12 plus 5. Right, so we divided 17 by 12, we got a remainder of 5. And then next, we divide 12 by 5. So that's 2 times 5 plus 2. Next step, we divide 5 by 2, and we get 5 is equal to 2 times 2 plus 1. And we can actually stop here, because this remainder is 1, so we're ready to do our back substitution. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange these equations to get give 1 as a multiple of 17 plus a multiple of 12. So, what are we doing? 1 is equal to 5 minus 2 times 2, which is, well, 5 is 17 minus 12. And we've got 2 times, well, where was 2? 2 first appeared as 12 minus 2 times 5. And that is 17 minus 12 minus 2 times 12 minus 2 times 17 minus 12. Okay, um, so if you multiply those out, just collect the terms in 17. How many 17s have I got? I have 5 17s there, and I have 7 minus 7 12s. If you check that, you'll find it's correct. Um, so what we've got is now we've computed the inverse of 12 in F17, and the answer would be whatever you multiplied 12 by. So the answer here is minus 7, not 7, minus 7. So our conclusion, oops, wrong drawing tool. 
So 1 over 12 is equal to minus 7 in F17. And if you'd like that as a positive number, of course, you could notice that minus 7 is the same as 10 in F17. Let's do another one just for fun. So in F17, let's work out 1 over 13. So our new question is what is 1 over 13 in the finite field F17 again? Well, again, what we do is try and divide 17 by 13. So 17 is equal to 1 times 13 plus 4. 13 is equal to 3 times 4 plus 1. And actually, we can stop straight away because we've got to remainder 1 immediately. So we're then going to rearrange to get 1 as a multiple of 17 and 13. So what do we do? Well, we have 1 is 13 minus 3 times 4. And that's 13 minus 3 times 17 minus 13. So that is, collect the 13s, you've got 4 times 13 minus 3 times 17. Okay, again, you can check that that's correct. And it gives us straight away the multiplicative inverse of 13 in the finite field F17. It's going to be, let me choose a better color there, it's going to be 4. So 1 over 13 is equal to 4 in F17. Okay, that algorithm which we're doing, this division algorithm, um, this repeated division algorithm, is called Euclid's algorithm. It's actually much more general than um, what we've been, we've been doing. You can use it to calculate the greatest common divisor of any two integers. And some of you may have seen it before as a calculational tool for greatest common divisors.